Well, well, well. Well, well, well. Now, I was meant to have a long weekend. I didn't. I worked yesterday and I worked Sunday. I went down to a press conference. Um, and we had a good show yesterday. Um, can I just say a big thank you to Bryce Edwards, Chris Trotter and Bomber. Good to know people from all across the political spectrum because they gave us some great insight yesterday, which it has, since my show 24 hours ago, been proven true. So if anyone thinks that this was a sudden emotional decision by a kind of burnt-out Prime Minister to leave and, and then the Labour Party miraculously uh, had a bloodless coup and installed a new leadership and it was all just unicorns and rainbows riding out of the sunset or into the sunset, uh, that's a big pile of BS, isn't it? It is now becoming clear from what Hipkins himself has said that certain people within the Labour leadership were given a month's notice, a month's notice, that Jacinda Ardern was throwing in the towel and they had a month to strategise and figure out how to take control of, well, to be honest, not just the Labour Party, but the government how to install a new leadership and in some ways a not-so-new leadership in the government in a seamless and bloodless manner. And those people are the people, and, and we look behind the scenes and see what changes there are in the Prime Minister's office, very, very few. Very, very few. Chris Hipkins is the new front man and he has given some indications that Labor will try in the next nine months to rebrand itself as not so friendly to Māori, not so interested in the Treaty of Waitangi, not so interested in co-governance, not so interested in merging the state broadcasters, not so interested in Three Waters. They are going to try and tell you that they are the working class heroes of New Zealand. They are not into extreme feminism uh, or identitarian politics and they also like the Pacific Island community because a lot of voters in the Pacific Island community. But the idea that all of this was some remarkable explosion of empathy, I think is uh, that is decreasing um, and no one should be fooled by that. This was a calculated, a calculated and well-executed, I'll take my hat off to them for that, a well-executed coup or transfer of power that keeps essentially the same people who were running Labour in control of Labour. And maybe they've abandoned whatever principles they had or they are prepared to in the interests of re-election. But don't think, don't think this wasn't all, as Blackadder would say, a cunning plan. And meantime, what are we getting from our news media? Well, unfortunately, more of the same. And I would like to stress at this stage, though I thank them for their service and we pay them for it, the people who provide our news bulletins, um, I don't have any editorial control over them, but I believe it's important that you, as platform followers, subscribers, listeners, that you get an overview, a snapshot of what's happening in the news in the day. I don't run that sort of newsroom, so we buy that service off a third party. And that third party... Uh, I think they do a pretty good job most of the time. But they have brought into a narrative, a narrative that I thought might have waned over the weekend, but it has not. Because the headlines that mainstream media and the columnists are still giving you are essentially designed to beatify, to canonise, to martyr um, Jacinda Ardern to make her the victim of some conspiracy of misogyny, of nastiness, of online trolling. Uh, it is a narrative coming from the left and, it's, and our academia. And yet again this morning, another, and we're going to try and get hold of the, uh, of the authors of this, Auckland University Hate Research, is a group called Hate and Extremism Insights Aotearoa, Geez, I hope all these bloody organisers, you know, like the disinformation project. I hope, actually, that Hipkins would be smart enough to disband and make sure none of these outfits get supported by the government. 
But the researchers, the experts are back at it, saying that nine out of every ten hateful posts in their survey target the Prime Minister. Well, there's a simple reason for that. And it's not because she's a woman. It's because she's the Prime Minister. She holds the most important position in the land, the most powerful political position in the land. So when people are peeved off, who do they blame? Well, the buck stops, doesn't it, with the Prime Minister, whether it's a man or a woman or someone who identifies as a man or a woman. So that isn't misogyny. But tell the mainstream media that and they'll tell you, yeah, no, that you're a racist or, or, or a woman hater. I, I want to highlight this morning an article we're going to be publishing later today from one of our most popular and insightful um, authors and contributors on Platform Opinion. His name is Graham Adam, and I'm just going to cherry pick from the column he sent to me yesterday, and I read through and I thought, man, he's nailed it. And I absolutely recommend when this uh, opinion piece goes up that you get hold of it and you share it with your friends and you think about what he's saying. It's a long piece, it's a long read, longer than, than I like sometimes, but Graham makes so many good points. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through it. Um, it is headlined, and I think we'll stick with this headline, The Martyrdom of Jacinda Ardern. Opinion. In the wake of Ardern's abrupt resignation, the mainstream media are determined to convince us she was hounded from office mainly because she's a woman and had to fall on her sword to escape unrelenting gendered abuse. The fact that Adern has overseen a bonfire of what was a vast store of political capital just two years ago and was facing a resounding defeat at this year's election has mostly gone unremarked amongst the flood of columns defending her as the unfortunate victim of trolls and misogynists. Massey University School of Management senior lecturer Suze Wilson even, even praised Ardern's bravery in resigning. Any woman who finds herself subject to abuse is entitled to do what she needs to do to get on with her life and we should unequivocally respect and support that good on her. Well, journalists generally have bent over backwards to accommodate and excuse Ardern abandoning the team of five million at the beginning of an election year. Despite the fact that unlike John Key in 2016, she provided no obvious succession plan or even left her party in a good position to win in October. A day after she announced her resignation, I received a message from a female journalist in Europe who was perplexed by the reaction of the New Zealand media. Quote, I'm surprised to see that many people seem to think Jacinda Ardern resigned in a beautiful manner. Aren't people angry? Well, journalists and commentators are angry, but not at her. The object of their ire is mainly the allegedly mean-spirited, stupid and ungrateful public who apparently refused to sufficiently acknowledge and respect her virtues as Prime Minister. Feminist writer Sandra Coney wrote on Facebook, New Zealanders don't know a good thing when it's standing in front of them and happily employ misogynist insults and threats against a young woman admired by the rest of the world. Usually a captain abandoning a sinking ship ahead of the officers, crew and passengers in the first life boat available is regarded as an unforgivable act of cowardice. The fact that he or she might be tired or stressed or overworked never trumps their duty to those in their care. Astonishingly, New Zealand, in New Zealand, most journalists have preferred to blame the passengers for losing faith in their captain, despite the fact she has recklessly steered the ship of state and her party onto the rocks. The media appears to believe the passengers are at fault for objecting to the fact that Adern was taking them on a voyage they mostly hadn't agreed to be on. Not least, Ardern fronted a persuasive and stealthy push to insert co-governance with Māori into many areas of New Zealand life, from three waters and health to education and local government, without having campaigned on it or having a mandate for it. The increasingly visceral reaction to her steady undermining of democracy and her government's general incompetence seems to be interpreted by many commentators as a case of voters failing her rather than the reverse. 
Against reason, we are effectively asked to believe that a nation that gave Ardern an unprecedented majority in 2020, alongside personal popularity ratings in the 70s that outshone anything John Key achieved, has become a deeply misogynistic nation in just two short years. And this, despite the fact that Ardern herself has denied misogynistic abuse played any part in her resignation, as she told NewsHub when asked whether misogyny influenced her decision. I did not, it did not, and my strong message to women in leadership and girls who may be considering leadership in future, this is a place where the foundation was laid long before me to make it possible for us to be in these roles. It is evident from many reports that women in politics do receive more personal abuse than men, but there is nevertheless a glaring imbalance in the type of abuse each sex gets and how they are expected to deal with it. Male politicians are personally abused in ways that would be unthinkable if directed at females. Uh, Over the weekend... Stuff journalist Michelle Duff complained about gendered abuse in the case of a bar in Auckland that displayed a crudely drawn sign announcing a Red Witch leaving party to celebrate Adern's resignation. Stuff journalists also highlighted a social media ad for discounted drinks at a Nelson bar that have featured a graphic of her being fed into a wood shipper being towed by a hearse. When the reporter asked if the general manager would consider making posts that uplifted women, he responded, would you be giving me the same phone call and asking the same question if it was the National Party in power and Mr Luxon was going through the chipper? And there's the rub. Men, and particularly men on the right, are considered fair game. The left erupted in cheers on social media when Adern was outed for having called David Seymour an arrogant prick in Parliament at the end of last year. But it would be impossible for Seymour to call Ardern an arrogant bitch and not be swamped by a tsunami of condemnation. The glaring double standard in what abuse is tolerated for men and women is perhaps best exemplified by the reaction in 2017 to a five-metre-high statue of then-Environment Minister Nick Smith showing him defecating as he crouched over a glass with his genitals exposed. Artist Sam Mann made the statue as a protest over Smith allegedly allowing the pollution of waterways. Not only did Mahan parade the statue, or Mann, uh, parade the statue outside the Environment Canterbury offices in Central Christchurch, It received widespread coverage both locally and overseas, including by the BBC. Mann defended his statue to the New Zealand Herald. As far as displaying Nick's genitals to the world, perhaps the uh, Econ uh, chief executive has never entered a gallery or visited the Vatican City and cast his gaze on the multitudinous penises in bronze and marble that swarm around the square, much to the delight of the children the Pope, and one or two extraordinary cardinals, he said. Imagine the uproar if an artist made a similar statue of a Dern, naked from the waist down, squatting over a glass, and then dismissed the critics as prudes. RNZ interviewed a woman in the crowd of 50 supporters who watched the statue being positioned. The reporter identified the woman as Donna Miles Mojab, who voiced her approval of it. This speaks to the important issue of our time, she said. People are really concerned about the state of our water. It speaks truth to power, which is exactly what art should do. Well, it's very difficult to look at Nick Smith again and not think about the degradation of water at his hands. Not long before Mann's statue protest, Smith said he had had rat poison rubbed in his hair and clothes at a Nelson market as a protest against his advocacy of 1080 drops. A woman was later found guilty of offensive behaviour. In stark contrast, Michelle Duff's weekend column included examples of sexism Adern faced that included Paula Bennett, a woman, telling Adern to zip it, sweetie, and the placard a farmer had held at a protest in Morrinsville that declared Adern to be a pretty communist. 
On Waitangi Day in 2016, a nurse, Josie Butler, threw a dildo at Economic Development Minister Stephen Joyce that struck him in the face. The image of the pink dildo looming large over Joyce's surprised face was lampooned around the world, including on John Oliver's satirical TV show um, with an audience in the millions. Oliver included a segment devoted to dancing giant dildos and a clip of Sir Peter Jackson waving a New Zealand flag with an image of a dildo on it. Yet the uproar, if Ardern was to be struck in the face with a dildo or any other object held at her by a man, would be tumultuous and overwhelmingly condemnatory of the misogyny motivating the assault. No one in the media would dream of celebrating an act like that. Certainly journalists wouldn't be lionising the thrower in the way dildo girl Butler was, she told stuff the moment she did finally throw the dildo felt fantastic. Fantastic. I recommend to everyone, to everybody, I really feel empowered. Like, you don't actually own me. You don't have all the power here. I have some power too. Yet Joyce, dubbed Dildo Baggins, was expected to take the assault and the humiliation with good humour, which he did, referring to it as part of the privilege of serving. There are tons of other examples where male politicians are expected to take being humiliated publicly about sexual and bodily matters as good sports in a way that no one would dare try with a female politician. Who would dare ask a senior female politician, let alone the soon-to-be former Prime Minister who has admitted to dyeing her hair, if the curtains match the carpet? Well, Winston Peters did that in 2015 as a jibe in Parliament at John Key apparently dyeing his hair. When the AM show host Ryan Bridge asked Adern in 2020 if she'd dyed her hair because it was greying, he received an avalanche of hate mail. Adern is hardly alone in receiving threats. Nick Smith said that he faced death threats as Environment Minister and former Labor Cabinet Minister Richard Preble wrote in the, New Zealand, uh, as Richard Preble wrote in the Herald last week. Uh, I received many threats, including death threats. The police insisted on prosecuting two, one who physically attacked me outside a public meeting and another who sent a white powder through the place claiming it was anthrax. I had a Doberman and a huge German shepherd for a reason. The mainstream media have also conveniently forgotten the song Kill the Prime Minister in 2014 that announced an intention not only to kill John Key but also to have sex with his daughter. Max Key told a NetSafe conference in Auckland back in 2016 that he received death threats twice a week. The abuse continues. An image of Chris Luxon's bald head repeated in a stack of folded newspapers that unfortunately represents uh, or resembles a penis has appeared widely on social media and even on some reputable blogs. And dismissing him as a stale pale male is so common on social media it seems unremarkable. The most egregious example of the double standard in recent times, of course, was US porn star Stormy Daniels' detailed description in her memoirs of Donald Trump's penis and sexual prowess, or actual lack of it. Those details of her intimate relationships with him were widely reported in the world's media in late 2018, including here in New Zealand. Yet it is unimaginable that a lover who described a senior female politician's genitalia and sexual performance so graphically in print would receive anything but reactions of pronounced disgust, if not revulsion. They would certainly never be able to find a reputable publisher. Daniel's memoir, Full Disclosure, was also published by St Martin's Press, one of the world's biggest English language publishers. The description of Trump's penis were widely used as a teaser for interviews and reviews, and it became a bestseller. Ironically, Adern has been complicit herself in an extraordinary legislative move to make misogyny official government policy. The passing of the Birth, Deaths, Marriages and Relationships Registration Act in 2021, which includes or introduces a self-identification process, for changing the sex shown on a person's New Zealand birth certificate effectively makes being a woman simply a state of mind.
By making the definition of a woman a movable feast that includes biological men, she has helped erase the scientific and common sense definitions that underpin women's sex-based rights. And that, folks, that really is misogyny. I think that's a great column from Graham uh, Adams. I think it's one of the best we've published. We're going to publish it later today. I thoroughly recommend that you read The Martyrdom of Jacinda Ardern. And I thoroughly recommend, as you are subject to an avalanche of ill-considered propaganda about misogyny in this country, that you recognise the truth of what is happening here politically and the truth of what has happened in the Labour Party. Jacinda Ardern is not going because a bunch of Neathandal misogynist male chauvinist pigs wore her down to the point of exhaustion. She is going because the policies of her administration were becoming increasingly unpopular amongst a wide number of group of New Zealanders, men, women, uh, Māori, non-Māori, immigrants, Pākehā, if you want to use that word. People didn't like her government and they identified her government as her. And those in the Labour Party who want to maintain power, those sitting in the Labour caucus who even if they lose don't want to lose their seats and the income that comes with it, they looked and said, can we win with her? And the answer was a resounding no. And Jacinda Ardern decided to go and she told her mates, Chris Hipkins and Grant Robertson, and they cooked up a plan over Christmas so that one of them would be able to take over. One of them would be able to take over and maybe salvage something from the Titanic-like wreck that is this Labour government. Uh, It has nothing to do with misogyny. That is the inevitable drone of a bought-off, biased media where people in editorial control have drunk the Kool-Aid of fourth-wave feminism, of critical race theory and biased, biased journalism. Uh, I think the big problem we've seen in the last week or since last Thursday is that you might be able to change the Prime Minister, that Prime Minister might indeed make some significant changes in theory to many of the policies that have annoyed and dismayed middle-of-the-road New Zealanders. But we're not going to have real change and progress in this country until we can change our news media, until they collectively stop writing the sort of BS that we are, have been over the last few days and are still being subjected to. There we go. Quite a rave, the opening stanza of the show this morning. Um, but it had to be said. Graham, Adam, I thank you for a stunning column, which we're going to get up today. And we're going to promo the hell out of it because it is a fantastic read and a really good take on what is going on in this country.